thank you for hanging out for after lunch. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about the love story between a PCP and the problem of delegating computation. So Ran kind of uh, started uh, uh, with an introduction, but I'm going to try to give a bit more of an overview uh, of the field. I'll present again the problem briefly, give an overview of the field. And I'm going to focus on a very, very recent uh, joint work with Omer uh, Panet, who was, uh, he's a postdoc at MIT, going to be a faculty here at Tel Aviv University, and Lisa Yang, who's an undergrad student at MIT. OK, so why are we motivated uh, by this problem? So you know, the way we store data and do computations has shifted dramatically in the last several years you know, with the uh, cloud computing and abundance of weak devices, uh, now often we store our data elsewhere, we do our computations elsewhere, and this raises a lot of uh, questions. Uh, one of the questions as a cryptographer is that of privacy, okay, how do we ensure privacy of, of our data? But another question, which is perhaps even more fundamental, is that of integrity. How do we know that the computation that is done up there in the cloud is correct? And this is going to be uh, the focus of my talk, as was the focus of Rand's talk. OK, so let me just redefine quickly uh, the problem of delegating computation. So we have uh, a weak device. We have the cloud. The weak device delegates a computation. So here you want the cloud to run a Turing machine, m, an input x, and for t steps, and you want to know the output, and the cloud will compute the output y from him, but because we may not trust this cloud, we want a proof that indeed the output of this string machine after t steps on input x is y. Okay, so we want such a proof. Uh, and of course, fundamentally, we really need this proof, the time to verify should be significantly less than t, the time to do the computation. Otherwise, the smartwatch would do the computation on its own and that's it. OK, so the point is, he's a weak device. He cannot or does not want to do to run in t time <coughs> steps. He wants to delegate it and be able to verify the results in time significantly <coughs> less than t. OK, so that's the goal. And immediately when you look at it, at least the complexity uh, theorists will say, this is impossible. OK, we know that in general, we cannot uh, proof, give a proof for any time t computation where verifying takes time less than t. So this is impossible. But you know, for cryptographers, there's no such thing as impossibility. So we, that's you know, what we do for a living. We overcome these impossibilities. Uh, so what we're going to show, what, what uh, we're going to show today is how to, or this line of work, is how to use cryptography, the magic of crypto, to get around these uh, impossibility results. OK, but before we uh, dive into, uh, in, into how we do that, let's first define this problem a little more uh, rigorously. So what do we want from uh, such a, so what is this proof? What do we want from such a proof? So OK, uh, we of course want the standard completeness, OK? So we want to ensure that if the prover behave honestly, the verifier accepts the proof with, let's say, probability 1 or close to 1. For soundness, we relax the soundness condition because we know we cannot get statistical soundness, so we relax the soundness condition and say we ensure that only PPT cheating provers, so only bounded cheating provers, only cheating provers that cannot break some underlying cryptographic assumption cannot cheat. Okay, so they cannot convince us to accept an incorrect statement except with some negligible probability. Okay, so this is, by the way, if you have questions, feel free to stop me at any point. Yes. Okay, so uh, good. So uh, I'll tell you exactly. Okay, so efficiency. What we want from the efficiency is we want the prover not to run in too long. So I'm answering the question right here. I want the prover to have only, let's say, polynomial overhead. Okay, so if the computation takes time t, he'll run time poly t. The verifier. I, I want him to run in time. Well, he needs to read the input, which is n already. And I, the overhead, I want it to be something like poly log t. 
Okay, and also it's a security parameter that we'll use for the cryptography, embed the cryptography. And if you want, you can think of the security parameter as just log t. But to your question, yeah, if t is just n, then it, you read the input anyway in a sense, so you know you don't need it. Even though I have to say there are some, uh, some of these works uh, talk even on, on where the restrict the verifier to run in time even sublinear in n where you have like an encoded access to, uh, to x, but I don't want to kind of talk about that. But there are also these works, a lot of these works, also the work uh, that Ran talked about, and a lot of the works I'm going to talk to about today extend to the sublinear domain, actually. So, okay, so this is our goal. Uh, any, question, any further questions? Okay, so the focus, I want to just emphasize that as opposed to the traditional work on interactive proofs, MIP, PCPs, the focus here is actually on polynomial time computations, okay? So uh, we, this is also called what we call doubly efficient uh, proofs. So usually in the regime of interactive proofs or MIP or PCP, we think of the prover as all-powerful. And uh, the, the verifier is, is polynomial time, and the question is kind of how, uh, how much can we prove? Here the, the um, uh, parameters are a bit uh, different. Uh, I think we have a question here from a young member. <laughs> uh, uh, so here, we, the focus is actually on polynomial time computation. Everybody's polynomial time. We're kind of in the real world. But the verifier needs to be very efficient. So the prover is also pretty efficient. Okay, it's only polynomial blow up. The verifier needs to be extremely efficient. And hence the world doubly efficient. Okay. So <clears throat> here are the properties that we desire, that we would like to achieve of these proofs. So the first thing we really want is these proofs to be non-interactive. What do I mean by non-interactive? They cannot be completely, completely non-interactive, but we can hope to have them be non-interactive assuming some common reference string or assuming some public parameters. Okay, so what, here's the goal is the following. We would want to say, okay, we have some public parameters or CRS, common reference string, in the sky, and given this, we want the proof to just be kind of a certificate, a one message thing. That's it. Okay, so that's our goal. Uh, another desired property is we want it to be publicly verifiable, meaning we want to ensure everybody can verify the proof. You don't need to know some trap door, some secret information about the CRS in order to verify. Now, you may ask, why, why am I insisting on this non-interactive and public verifiable properties? And one, first, it, you know, it's nice to just have a certificate that everybody can verify. It's kind of, this is what NP is about. I'm trying to kind of go back to the origins, right? That's what we think of a proof. What is a proof? It's a certificate that everybody can verify, and it's a one-message thing. So it's natural. But also, actually, in practice, like for, for blockchain applications, you really need this. And this is actually used in blockchain applications, and Eli, I think, is going to talk about this uh, later today. So for such application, you really want the proof to be non-interactive and publicly verifiable. Okay, so the other assumptions you want, the other properties you want, you want the soundness. So as, as I said, we need to use cryptography here. And there's a question, what assumptions do you rely on? And ideally, we want to rely on standard assumptions, you know, assumptions that are well studied and we believe hold. And finally, we want, you know, ideally we want our, our delegation scheme to be for all polynomial time computations, deterministic, ideally maybe even non-deterministic computation, and so on. So we want kind of as large as possible of class of functions or uh, computations that we can delegate. Okay, so <clears throat> these are our, our desired properties, and uh, I just want to say there's a lot of work on delegation. There's a lot of theory work on delegation. A lot of the theoretical work actually has been implemented and already shipped kind of to practice. I think it's a very, like a really, really successful uh, area where you see kind of a real uh, nice, uh, you know, marriage between uh, theory and practice. And again, I think, uh, so this talk I'm going to focus more on the theory side. I think Eli Ben Sasson will talk about uh, the practical side uh, later, um, later today. But what I want to say, so this, you know, these are schemes are practical, are implemented, and so on. And for those of you who were kind of in a comma in the last uh, coma in the last 10 years, uh, will be maybe surprised to know that the underlying primitive in all these works is PCPs. Okay, so all these work use kind of this non-practical non kind of crazy theoretical idea of PCPs are kind of the underlying 
kind of underlying primitive in all these works. I think it's remarkable. OK, but how do we use PCPs to get this? So, uh, so Juan talked about it in, in, the, in, in his talk, but for those who, who you know, were blinking out a bit or didn't attend this talk, so it, at first it seems kind of not clear, right? Because the PCP is very long. It's as long as the computation, of course, at least. So uh, the verify, you can't send him the PCP. So how, it's not, immediately it's not really clear how to use it. And I mean, it's tempting to just you know, send the queries and get the answers, but uh, I mean, the PCP answers in these locations. But of course, this is not sound due to, because of adaptivity issues. So, you know, it's, it's a priori, it's at least not clear how to use it. Uh, but then, you know, the first uh, person to actually use them, for, as far as I know, was Kilian in 92. And he said, okay, we'll use cryptography uh, uh, to, to this effect. And essentially what he did, he said, you know what, at first let's do kind of a preamble phase where the prover will commit to the PCP. And he'll use kind of a shrinking commitment. So he'll take this long string, kind of commit to it using a shrinking commitment. It's a basic cryptographic primitive. And uh, so he'll use shrinking commitment with local opening. So you can open to each location very efficiently. And we know how to do that using what's called Merkle hash. Again, don't want to go into the detail, but in crypto, that's kind of uh, bread and butter of cryptography. We know how to do this. And which gave uh, kind of the... Uh, uh, Killian, the theorem that you have interactive delegation, it's four messages uh, for all of NP, uh, assuming just collisions and hash function, that's what you need for, for this commitment scheme. Wonderful. So this was a, a beautiful result in the early 90s, but we said our focus is non-interactive, and this scheme is interactive. Okay, so, the, okay, so we didn't want to move to the non-interactive regime, but before we do so, uh, I want to say if we are in the interactive regime, Actually, we have results that are stat with statistical soundness that don't rely on any computational assumptions. Uh, the first is, is for bounded depth. Um, the second is for bounded space. Uh, but these uh, are, are uh, interactive. OK, so, and, but even though, even these interactive solutions use PCPs in them uh, in some form of another, or another, implicit or explicitly. And actually, there's a very nice result of Rothblum and Vadan, uh, I, I think I'll be vague which Rothblum it is. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, okay, Guy and, and Salil, that actually they say that uh, any delegation scheme, Im at least implicitly, must use a PCP. Okay, so it's really kind of a, kind of if and only if thing. Okay, so we want non-interactive. How do we get these schemes to be non-interactive? So there's two main heuristics that have been used in the literature. <clears throat> the first is a very, very famous heuristic called the fiat Chamir heuristic. It was first used by Mikali, applied to the Killian algorithm, the four message. It's essentially the fiat Chamir heuristic, I'm not gonna define it, but it's a way to eliminate interaction from interactive protocols that are public coin, that the verified just in random coins. So this is very nice. However, in general, this heuristic is known to be not sound. Okay, so we actually have examples of interactive uh, uh, protocols that are computationally sound where this fiat heuristic completely fails. Okay, so it's not secure, it's not sound. Okay, however, it turns out that if you apply this heuristic to statistically sound proofs, uh, then under very strong assumptions at least, we do think we, they are sound. In particular, there's, the, uh, there's a recent result of Canetti et al. that shows that if you apply the fiat heuristic to GKR, which is the interactive protocol for bounded depth uh, computation, uh, then this protocol, when you kind of reduce, when you eliminate interaction using the fiat it is secure, but under a very, very strong assumption. And the assumption says that any PPT algorithm uh, there's this uh, fully, uh, FHE, fully morphic encryption scheme, said that every PPT algorithm can find the secret key. Oh, the best you can do is guess it. So the probability of opening the secret key is like guessing time poly. So you can't do better than guessing, essentially. So it's a very, very strong assumption. Okay. Uh, that's all I want to say about the Fiat Chimir. Actually, I don't want to, that's not the focus of this talk. I want to actually focus on the BMW uh, a heuristic that Ran talked about. And what they said, uh, uh, they said, you know what, let's use PCP. Of course, we can't give the queries in the clear. 
because it won't be sound. We'll encrypt them, each query kind of using uh, uh, fully homomorphic encryption, each one using diff kind of fresh keys. So you encrypt query one using one key, query two another key, query three, yet yeah, as many queries as you have, and then the prover should do the computation under the hood of the encryption scheme. Okay, so you should compute the answers under the hood. Okay, so this is the heuristics, the, the BMW heuristic. I went over it very fast because you heard about it, but any question about kind of this protocol, this heuristic? Maybe I should mention, for those who know this heuristic is from 99, at that time we didn't have a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. This is probably before Gentry was born. Uh, but, uh, uh, but actually, they didn't define this heuristic in terms of FHE. They defined it using what's called computational peer scheme, private information retrieval. So you can just rely on computational peer scheme, which is a weaker assumption, but it's easier to kind of um, explain it using the FHE terminology. So I'm, we're going to use the FHE terminology. Okay? Okay, questions? More questions? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So turns out, as Ran showed, yeah, he, oh yeah, maybe he was alive, but a lawyer, it's true. Uh, so, you know, half alive. <laughs> Before he was reborn. Uh, yes, so as Ran showed you, uh, well, Ran showed you that the, there was a proof, he gave you a false proof, but actually there's more than a false proof. This was actually shown to be not sound, okay? So this, uh, there, there's, uh, it's in particular in the recent work of Dodi Setal, they actually gave an example of an fully homomorphic encryption scheme and an MIP that are, each one of them is sound, but yeah, when you put it together to apply this heuristic, it breaks, soundness doesn't hold anymore, okay? Uh, under some cryptographic assumptions. So this is not sound. Okay, so wh what do we do? So what Ran showed you is, uh, you know, what, what we showed is what actually, actually it is sound if you ask a lot from the PCP, namely you don't take any PCP, you take a PCP that has this non-signaling soundness. Okay. And this, uh, okay, so, uh, so we have this result, and after this result there's two kind of, two questions left, were left open from uh, uh, this result. First is, remember we wanted public verifiability. This heuristic is not publicly verified. To verify the proof, you need the secret keys. So if we think of the first message as kind of parameters, if you want, and the proof is just the answers, nobody can verify. These are ciphertexts. To be able to verify, you need the secret keys. But if you know the secret keys, of course, you don't have any soundness. So it's not publicly verifiable. So this is one area of research. The other area of research is can it go beyond deterministic computations? So this theorem was only for deterministic computations. As we know, non-signaling PCPs you can only do for deterministic computation, as Ran showed. The question, can we go beyond? So these are kind of two line of works uh, that uh, uh, people worked on. Today I'm gonna focus on the public verifiability part. Okay, so I'm gonna try to show how to make this idea publicly verifiable. Good, so this result, so the, the Kera result was only for, they showed, take a deterministic Turing machine that runs in time t, and the prover runs in time poly t, the verify very efficient. What if I have a non-deterministic Turing machine with a witness, and you have like NP, okay? So you wanna convince me that a graph is three colorable, or you know, let's say there's a big witness, and you wanna convince me that you have a witness, and I still, I don't wanna run in time that's, you know, big, like maybe the witness is very big, I don't wanna run in time that depends on the witness, I wanna be succinct. So we don't have a result of, we don't know how to delegate such, how to do this kind of succinct proof uh, for NP. Uh, yeah, we, actually we don't, we, okay, so let me tell you what we know. So beyond deterministic computations. Actually there are a bunch of results that go beyond uh, a deterministic computations, uh, but we still don't know how to do it for any NP, so we still, do not know, even in the private verifiability setting, we don't know how to take an NP, like a NP statement, and produce kind of a cryptographic proof certificate, which is much shorter than the witness. We don't know how to do that. What? Oh yeah, we, we know heuristics. No, no, we have heuristics for these. We don't have it under kind of, compl you know, sound compl like complexity assumptions. Yeah, we have a lot of heuristics to do that. And, under non-standard assumptions, yeah, non-standard assumptions, yeah. 
So I'm going to say actually what I'm going to talk about a little more. Yes. Uh, but so we, we do have some, um, uh, a, we can extend the KRR. There are some extensions of the KRR beyond deterministic computation to NP, but not for all of NP. Okay? And for example, we know how to do it for bounded space non-deterministic computation and so on, but we still don't have the entire NP. And moreover, so this is open, but moreover, we know that uh, there's a barrier. So Gentry Ricks showed us that actually there's some, I don't want to go into the exact barrier, but in order to do that in general, you'll need some kind of non-black box reduction, which is, we don't, currently it's kind of beyond our, we don't know how to do this. Okay? Yes. Of course. Yes, this, the, yes. But even for non-adaptive, we don't know anything. Except for, for uh, under, non under kind of knowledge assumptions. Yeah, okay, so uh, let me just repeat the question. Uh, so the Gentry Wicks uh, barrier only holds if uh, the cheating prover, so the cheating prover chooses the statement after seeing the CRS. And the question was, what if he, is forced to choose the same many cheats on before seeing the CRS. Can we get soundness? And so we don't know. And at the, you, if you're asking me what I believe is true, it depends if it's uh, you know even or odd day. I tried, I really tried hard to extend the Gentry Wicks res negative result, and there was a time that I really believed it should go through and got stuck uh, with a bunch of people in the audience here, including Neil. So he shares my frustration. And then in other days, I, since we got stuck so much, I said, okay, probably you can do it. So I tried, but got stuck at that too. So I think it's a great, great question. Uh, if anybody, you know, solve it, it will really help me and take me out of this misery state of, of uh, you know, uh, so yeah, I don't know. But I'm <laughs> counting on you, maybe you'll maybe help me with that. Okay. So, uh, okay, so we're gonna, from now on, focus on public verifiability. Okay? But again, I want to emphasize, we, we do have heuristics for all of NP. Actually, you can just take the Fiat Shamir and apply that. Uh, that's what Kilian did in 94. He took the Kilian, applied Fiat Shamir heuristic, he got non-interactive delegation for all of NP. But it's not under, it's in what's called random oracle model, it's not under some standard cryptographic assumption. Okay, so from now on, let's focus on public verifiability. Uh, okay, so this is not publicly verifiable because, again, you need to test, the verifier needs to do some tests, the PC, essentially needs to run the PCP verifier or the MIP verifier, let's think of it as PCP, PCP verifier and the queries and answers, but these are encrypted. So to do this test, you need to know the secret key, it seems like. Okay, so this is a problem. So uh, what, what, what do we do? So there's a lot of work on this problem as well and how to make this idea public, publicly verifiable. And there's two heuristics that have been used here. One, first one is say, you know what, relax semantic security. Why do I need, to? okay, I understand that I need to hide the queries, but does it have to be hidden so well so that like I'm completely blind? Maybe relax it in a way that the queries are still hidden, but you can do this test. Okay, so there's a lot of work on this. Um, this work, a lot of this has also been implemented, so a lot of kind of the implementation slides I show you uh, is, uh, uses kind of this line of work. But the security proofs are under what's called knowledge assumptions. So this is not like a complexity assumption. Um, in particular, it's, it uses kind of the proofs use non, a non-explicit reduction. So there's no win-win situation that we like in cryptography. So most of cryptography is based on assumptions, right? But so why do I have provable, I mean, it's not provable, it's based on the assumption, so why, why even bother with provable secure, secure encryption? And the answer is because we have this win-win situation that either the scheme is secure or we got an algorithm for breaking factoring or something like that. This type of assumption don't give us that. It's kind of using non exclusive reduction, it kind of assumes that the adversary behaves in a certain way. Okay, so this is line of work, I'm gonna explain this, I'm gonna show this line of work, I'm gonna uh, say more about this. The other uh, work, uh, which is by um, a Panet and Rothblum, um, is uh, a, they said, you know what, keep the, the semantic security, but add kind of a weak zero test that somehow you can test miraculously, okay? And actually they even constructed such a, such a scheme, but based on what's called multilinear maps, they needed this kind of clean multilinear maps, again, don't want to go into it, but there's no instantiation. So we don't know how to, we don't have candidates 
for such multilinear maps. And what I'm going to talk to you, what I want to talk to you today about is a very recent work uh, with uh, Omer and Lisa, where we showed how to actually make both these approaches, both these kinds of work, uh, uh, provably secure under some complexity assumptions and grouped with bilinear maps. What is this here? Good, I'm going to get to that. I, you, you don't need to understand at this point. This is kind of, so what am I going to do next? I'm going to show you the, the line of work on relaxing semantic security and how an idea of how to make it, uh, uh, how to instantiate under standard assumptions, under kind of complexity assumptions. And then I'm going to show you the, weak, the encryption with weak zero test. I'm going to define it and show you how to instantiate it based on these kind of bilinear assumptions. Okay, so questions before we begin. Okay, so let's start with uh, relaxing semantic security. So <clears throat> there's been a long line of work trying to do it. Here, here is their idea. They say, you know what, here you can't verify anything because everything is under the hood. Don't use semantic security. Use, instead of encrypting Q using semantic security, just take a group G and just take G to the Q1. Just put G to the Q1. It hides, you know, we assume discrete log is hold, so this should hide Q1. And similarly, Q2 and Q3. Okay, so again, take a generator of some group, uh, take a generator G of some group G and send these queries in the exponent. And have the prover give the answers in the exponent. Okay, that's the idea. Of course, we can do that only if the answer is a linear function of the queries, because the only thing we can do in the exponent is linear functions. But so we say, okay, use linear PCPs. Use a linear PCP like Hadamard. They're very efficient variants by now that have been implemented, but the basic one is Hadamard. And now do uh, the and compute the answer. It's a linear function computing the exponent. Now, what's nice? You need to verify, now the argument is that you can verify this. Well, so uh, uh, the answer is linear. If the test, the test that the verifier does is of total degree at most two, which the linear PCPs, the Hadamard and others have this property, then you can test this in the exponent. But what you need is a bilinear map. So what is a bilinear map? It just allows you to do one computation. It's like a group that you can do one uh, multiplication in the exponent. It allows to do one multiplication. So, okay, so you can do one multiplication, you get really degree two, perfect. And now you can check whether the exponent is zero or not. You can see whether you got g to the zero or in the target group, EGG to the zero. In other words, if you got the identity uh, element or not. That was their approach. This is the scheme. Okay, uh, question is, uh, okay, so great. Okay, so, and they think of this as a CRS, everybody can verify, it's really what we wanted. Okay, short, publicly verifiable, we have CRS, non-interactive, great. What are the drawbacks? First, because we use linear PCP, the, the PCP is huge. So the CRS actually is really large. It's actually as big as the computation. So these kind of delegation schemes are called to be, they're known to be delegation scheme in the pre-processing model. Okay, so because the CRS is very large, actually you don't need the entire CRS to verify. Um, to verify, you only need kind of a succinct uh, description of Q, I don't want to get into it. So the verification is very efficient, but the CRS is very long. That's the first drawback. Second is that the soundness is under knowledge assumption. We want, we want kind of complexity assumptions, you know, the type of assumptions were used, this, something is hard, you know. And th we don't know how, how, we don't have this under such knowledge, knowledge assumption. So the question is why? Why do we uh, understand this? So why do we need knowledge? What, what went wrong? Is it the fact that we relax semantic security? What, what, why, why, what is it? And our observation, okay, so <clears throat> our first observation is that, you know, we, we lost a lot more than semantic security we lost this kind of independence of keys. So remember in the, in the BMW heuristic, you assume that each query is encrypted using a fresh key. We don't use the same key. It's crucial. If you use the same key, everything breaks automatically. It was crucial that in independent keys. Here, it's like the same group element. You, so there's no independence here. And what we asked is, what if you use a different generator for each uh, query? So what if instead of using the same G, we choose random G1, G2, G3, we give them also as part of the CRS. But we all, and then we give G1 to the Q1, G2 to the Q2, and G3 to the Q3. 
Now is it secure? And what we showed is, at least if you apply it to the PCP from GKR, so GKR was an interactive proof, but you can think of it as a PCP. Uh, if you apply it on the PCP of GKR, then it is sound under the following complexity assumption. So I don't, you don't need to read the assumption. It's not very important. It essentially says that if I give you in the exponent t, a random t and t squared, it's hard to find coefficients of a non-zero polynomial that, that uh, t is a zero of that polynomial. But that's not important. And the, the point is that this assumption is kind of a, it's a new assumption, but it's the type of assumption that we used to see kind of in bilinear groups. Uh, it's just a complexity assumption. It's a, it's, um, a, a search assumption of constant size, uh, falsifiable. I, I, of course, I don't know if it's secure, if it's sound or not, if it's secure, if it's correct or not. We don't know if for any assumption uh, in, in cryptography, but it is secure in, the, um, what, in a generic, what's called a generic group model, which is kind of a sanity check. Uh, anyway, so this is, under this assumption, uh, we, uh, we have soundness. Okay, questions? No, so falsifiability is, is in, the, in the regime of P is really not the correct notion uh, of assumption, but it's in, if you give an assumption on its own, you want it to be kind of, so for example, even for delegation for P, non-interactive, we only knew how to, well, you can assume it, that the scheme is sound, but if you want kind of an independent assumption, we only knew how to do it under non-falsifiable assumption. And here it's like an independent assumption, looking assumption that's falsifiable. But yeah, I actually, for those who don't know what falsifiability is, I don't even want to define it, but it's just kind of the first order kind of things we want from an assumption is are satisfied. I, I, so, uh, yeah, it, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at this. Uh, one, one really interesting. Oh yes. Good. So uh, the GKR our protocol. What we gave an interactive proof. We didn't give a PCP, but you can think of this PCP as, as this interactive proof as a PCP. So I don't want to get into it, but you can interpret, you can move from this interactive proof to a PCP. So if you think of that PCP, then, then what? No, not, no, I don't know how to prove it for an interactive proof. Yeah, any interactive proof you can think of as a PCP if it's, if it's succeeding, yes. But I don't know how to do this for any PCP that comes from an interactive proof. I need it actually for Hadamard, it's not even complete. Because if you use different Hadamard, okay, so we did it, okay, so, oh, okay, so this is, sorry, I'll answer your question in the next slide. Uh, but this is the theorem. GKR is only from bounded depth computation, so we get for bounded depth, uh, uh, we get this assumption. We need long CRS, like all the other works in this, that follow this uh, path. A, <clears throat> a really interesting open problem if, uh, following uh, Yuval's question is, can we prove that it's sound for other PCPs? Okay, maybe, maybe the Adamal. So for the Adamal PCP, it's not even complete because you need a PCP where every test depends only on two generators. Otherwise, I don't even know how to, how to test. Uh, I need, so I can't have a test that depends on, men, on all three queries or if there's more and more queries. Uh, so, but still one can ask, you know, there are other PCPs that each test depends on only two queries and, can we prove security for that? We didn't explore this question much. Uh, so maybe we can go beyond bounded depth with this approach. Okay. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on the, the other path, which I think gives us a much more interesting result. So this is kind of our main result. Uh, and it follows the path of Omer and Guy. And here's what they proposed. And I'm gonna say what this week zero test is. Okay, what they said, let's take an FHE. Don't take any FHE. Take some FHE that will allow you to do this test. To just, it's everything is secure, 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 but you can kind of test whether the verifier would accept or not. Miraculously. So I have to say, they, they told me about their, this idea that they had a long time ago. Actually, they had it already in 2014, or maybe even a little earlier. 
and they told me of this idea. And uh, I remember I, Omer was my intern at the time, and I was like, there's no way this is going to work. And I, I, I even had a, a formal explanation why there's no way this is going to work, so let me, let me explain. I said, suppose even you have an FHE, which I give you kind of this perfect box. You can't, like the perfect thing, where you can test only if things uh, re accept or reject it and nothing else. I give you just magic box, the only thing it allows you to do is test whether the verifier accepted or not. That's it. Beyond that, all the security guarantees you have, you had before still remain. Even if this box is perfect, still semantic security breaks. And why the semantic security, it's still insecure. Semantic security will break and the scheme will be insecure. Why? So here's a very simple attack. What a cheating prover can do, he'll take actually, a he'll, his goal is to just learn the queries. And how will he learn, once he learns the queries, he can break uh, security, the soundness. How will he learn the queries? What he will do, he will take a statement, a true statement. He will convince you of a true statement. But what will he do? Under the hood of the FHE, he said, well, if Q1 is zero, I'm gonna cheat. Otherwise, I'm gonna be correct. And now you learned if Q1 is zero or not. He can do it bit by bit. So underneath that, he can decide, he'll decide whether to cheat depending on the properties of the queries. And therefore, learn the queries. Okay, so this thing is really, it breaks semantic security kind of, it breaks the entire security of the encryption scheme and, and, and that's it. And then you get no security of the delegation scheme. Questions, should I repeat? Yes, okay, one more, one, once again. Okay, how do you cheat? Under the hood, let, uh, let's do it even simpler. I'm gonna learn each bit of the query one by one. Here's what I'm gonna do underneath encrypt. I'm gonna do it for each bit of each query. I'm a cheating prover. I'm gonna take a correct statement. I'm gonna tell the verifier, I'm gonna to prove to you that M on input X equals one, and it, it does equal one. And here's my proof. I'm gonna say if the first bit, I'm gonna do it for each bit. If the first bit is zero, I'm gonna do the correct proof under the hood. If the first bit is one, I'm gonna give a cheating proof, at random. I know it's gonna be rejected. And now I check. I have this box that tells me if my proof was accepted or not. So now I know. If it's rejected, it means the, the um, uh, query was one. If it was accepted, the query was zero. And I'm gonna, uh, the, that first bit was one or the first bit was zero. I'm gonna do it bit by bit. Okay, and then the, so, so there's no semantic security. It seems like this approach, okay. So, however, still they managed to do it. And how? Because they were very clever in the way they defined their zero test. So. I took the zero test, kifshuto, <laughs> the simple version, you know. But no, they had a very interesting way of thinking of their zero test. In other words, their zero test was very, very weak. And that's why they managed to, to construct it. And in particular, so your question to what is this weak? This is a very good question. It's actually very, um, it's kind of the essence of, 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 of this uh, heuristic. It does not test if like an encryption is an encryption of zero. If it would, then it would indeed break semantic security. What it tests instead is rather the homomorphic computation you did on the ciphertext was just, you applied the zero function. That's essentially what it tests, which is actually independent of what's underneath the queries. It checks whether the application did is like the function that's always, always zero. It's kind of hard to understand this at this level, but a little, little more, more um, detail, what they do in the week zero test, the queries are encrypted. The, the prover computes under the hood, pi denotes for PCP, so the pi, the proof on location Q1, proof on location Q2 and Q3. And the verif so the pi's are homomorphic computations, the V is done kind of under the hood as well. And now they show the week zero test will, will pass if this function that takes Q1, Q2, Q3 and applies these pi and V is identically zero, always zero. If it's not always zero, it may fail. Even if, like, the, if you open the box and you look at Q, the queries and the answer, even if that passes, as long as this kind of homomorphic computation is not always zero, it's, then the week zero test may fail. 
So their test is very, very weak. It may give you a lot of uh, fail, even though the verifier, if he opened the, box, the encryption, he would pass. That's why it's very weak. But that's what allowed them to get, some, to get security. So, okay, but they got it from this multilinear maps where there's no instantiations. And what we do in this work is we construct this thing, this thing from bilinear maps. Okay, so we construct this uh, homomorphic encryption with weak zero test from bilinear maps. Uh, this homomorphic encryption is semantically secure, uh, and yet it has this weak zero test. Okay, so this is the theorem. We have an uninteractive publicly verified delegation scheme for any polynomial time computation. And the assumption is slightly different than the one before, but again, it's a decisional assumption this time. So it says if you have powers of S, again, the, the actual assumption is not important, so probably most of you can just blink. But uh, for those who are interested, it says if you have powers of S, then, and I give you, uh, in addition, powers of S with V and with v, and with v squared, you can distinguish between the case that V is completely random and V is a large multiple, uh, a large um, power of S. I don't know how to compare these two assumptions. I don't know. We didn't, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't think too much about that question. So, yeah. Uh, so this is a deci decisional version, decisional assumption, but again, it holds in the uh, generic group model. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> it seems like now we should just be done. All we need to construct this encryption. We apply the KRR scheme to it, and, and, uh, and we get public verifiability for free. Unfortunately, that path was quite painful because our encryption scheme that we con constructed, uh, there were a lot of painful details about this encryption scheme. So let me just uh, mention a few. So first of all, our encrypted queries, our fresh queries that you want to do homomorphic computations on, were actually very large. Uh, these, so I don't, I'm not going to show you that. I'm not going to show you the uh, encryption scheme. By the way, Omer Panit is going to give a talk on this in the in GTAX, the Greater Tel Aviv Crypto Seminar, a few weeks from now. So those who are interested, uh, he's an amazing speaker, uh, much better than I am. So you know, you'll enjoy that one. Uh, so he's going to kind of talk about the encryption scheme and so on. Uh, he, I'm not going to talk about the encryption scheme in, uh, itself, but I want to tell you a little bit of the properties that we had and the struggles. Uh, so our encryption scheme is not uh, an ideal encryption scheme like uh, you would expect, unfortunately. So first thing, our fresh ciphertext that you want to do homomorphic computations on are actually really big. So you need to say ahead of time, which, po co which computations, which homomorphic computations do you want to do? And if your homomorphic computation, if you want to apply circuit of size t, then fresh ciphertext are of size t. So again, we have this long CRS business. Okay, these queries are very long. The, if, you don't wanna, if you don't need to do homomorphic computations anymore, they become very short. So the answers are short. Uh, so you just, you need kind of to give a lot of information to enable the homomorphic computation, like a lot of auxiliary information that enable the homomorphic computation. That's what makes the fresh encryption large. But the answers are short. So first you get a very long CRS. So then they grow with the total degree of the homomorphic operation, uh, the homomorphic computation. Uh, so in our case, it's poly in, in the time. Yes. A degrees in Q. No, because it's log t. It's at least log t. So okay, go two to the log t. It's exponential in the degree. So it's two to the log t, which is t. It's exponential in the degree of, yeah. Um, the second thing, which is even worse, is that we need some kind of, I, I don't want to get into the detail, but we need some multi-key FHE. Never mind, but what, the, what is important is that the size of the, these queries also grow exponentially with the number of ciphertexts needed for, to do each verification. So, they go actually in like, take, it's like security parameter to the C, where C is the number of ciphertexts that are needed 
to do each verification test. So the verifier does a bunch of tests. And he needs a bunch of answers and queries for each test. If, the, if he needs more than constant, we get like super polynomial blow up. So we, the each test, in our case, each test can only depend on a constant number of ciphertexts. Otherwise, our blow up is super polynomial. So this is very important for us. And the problem with this is we don't have non signal I don't know of any non signaling PCP where that each test depends only on a constant number of ciphertexts or on a constant number of answers. So uh, like in the, our PCP that we built in Carrar, it depended on log t uh, ciphertext. Like just the, lim the low degree test depended on log t. So we can't use it. OK, so we can't use the non-signaling PCP. It seems like, ah, that's, um, that's a bummer. Nevertheless, we managed to uh, analyze it. So I want to tell you kind of the blueprint. Okay, the main idea, I'm not gonna give you proof or anything, but okay, the main idea of the scheme is exactly as done by BMW or KRR. We take the tableau of the computation, we convert it to a PCP, and we apply the BMW uh, heuristic on it. However, as opposed to uh, KRR, here we don't use any homomorphic encryption. We use one with a weak zero test, so it's publicly verifiable. Okay, the weak zero test allowed you to publicly verify. Moreover, we can't use any PCP because then there's going to be a huge blow up. So we use a specific PCP where, the, where each verification test depends only on a constant number of ciphertexts. Okay. Now, how does the proof go? Again, I'm not going to show you the proof, just kind of a very, very high level idea. So first question about the construction. Okay. So the proof, again, follows kind of the previous works. And the way previous works went around, the way the proofs went is as follows. You say, let's assume I have a cheating prover. I want to argue that it means if the cheat, or I have a convincing prover, I would say then it means the that his output is correct. Okay, so if I have a cheating prover, a convincing prover, the first step was to say that the tableau, at least locally, must be correct. So if you look at the local parts of the tableau, everything is consistent and looks correct. Then there was another part that goes from kind of local correctness to global correctness. By the way, this is very, very hand wavy, okay? And nothing I'm saying is really precise or meaningful, but just kind of to give you a high level idea. So this is how previous works, all previous works following Carral, that's the approach they took. Okay, this part from local to global, we use previous works, so we get uh, whatever the previous works, there's a lot of previous work that that's the, their focus. Going from the, if you have like a local satisfiability to imply correctness. And we have it for P and a little even more than P, like part of NP, like bounded space uh, non-deterministic. And actually the beyond P is very important for us as you'll see in the next slide. How about the first part? So this is where all our work was. So in Kara we did it for non-signaling PCPs. In Kara we showed if you have a non-signaling PCP and you had a cheating prover, then you get local correct, you get the, you can ensure that the tableau has this local correctness property. In our case, we don't have an unsignaling PCP with the efficiency that we want where each test depends only on a constant number of queries, which is what we need for efficiency. So instead we show this step, holes, for a PCP that actually we don't know if it's non-signaling or not, probably it's not. Okay, for a specific PCP, where indeed each test depends on a constant number of queries like we need for our efficiency. And then, and th that, that's how we get our result. But note that this result, it gives us what we want for a long CRS. Because as I said, the queries are actually very long. It's the length of, of uh, the encrypted queries like poly t. Because we need to give a lot of auxiliary information that will allow you to do the homomorphic computations. I promised you short CRS. This is long CRS. So we're not done. Yes. I, I, I said I don't know that it's not, I, I don't know, I, I don't know, what? Don't you need it to use that argument? No, that we, don't, we don't use that it's non-signaling because we don't know how to prove that it's non-signaling. So we show this for a PC, so okay, going back, this is very good, I see you're a little confused, so it's good because uh, maybe you should be confused. So <clears throat> with, uh, Aran told you that this approach works, 
essentially this approach is known to work almost, I, I'm kind of lying a little bit, but almost if and only if the PCP is non-signaling. And now I showed you with a PCP that's, I don't know how to prove that it's non-signaling. How, how? So the answer is, I used much more of my en encryption scheme. I don't know how to prove that this works for any encryption scheme. I actually used, to prove this, I actually used that my encryption scheme has a weak zero test. So I strengthened my crypto and therefore can relax what I need from the PCP. So I don't know how to prove this step for this PCP. I don't know how to prove that it's, that this, I go from, I get from a convincing prover to local, to, to blow the local correct. I don't know how to do this for any FHE. I do, I know how to do this for an FHE with a weak zero test. Right, it, you can think of it as, as the flavor, but, but we don't need knowledge assumptions at the point. Yes, exactly. We use more crypto and hence less from the PCP. Great questions. Uh, okay, so we have the long CRS that we're gonna show in the next slide how to get around. But in order to get around it, what's important for us actually is that the long CRS PCP, the, this long CRS delegation scheme is not only for P. It's actually, it's a, even beyond P. We can do it also for some non-deterministic computations. Let's say bounded space a, a non-deterministic computation. And that's very important for us because, so now, we, uh, now I'll tell you why it's important. Now I need to get rid of the long CRS. I wanna go from a scheme with long CRS to a scheme with short CRS. How do I do that? I use, I bootstrap. I do what's called a bootstrapping uh, theorem. This was done uh, by Bitansky et al. in the context of delegating uh, non-deterministic computation from knowledge assumptions. And we do it kind of something very similar in our setting. So we wanna say, I'm gonna take my delegation scheme with a long CRS, and I'm gonna convert it to a delegation scheme with a short CRS. But in order to do this, I need the underlying delegation scheme with a long CRS to support some non-deterministic computations, which it does, but it's very important. I don't know how to do this if it was only, only for P. So I'm not gonna say much about the bootstrapping, I'll just say kind of in one slide very quickly, kind of the idea and why you need NP. So the idea, and this is again, it's very, very similar to the, boots, to the previous bootstrapping work. The idea is uh, you take the computation which is very large, you partition it to small chunks. So the C here configuration, take the Turing machine, it has, uh, take the entire tableau, and partition it to kind of small chunks. And now, uh, so C0 is the initial configuration, C1, C2, C, K, K, some security parameter is the kth configuration, so on and so forth. And now what we do, we prove that from C0, you go to CK after K steps, from CK to CK squared, and so on and so forth. Why do we partition? Now each computation from C, uh, uh, let's say zero to CK is short. It's just K steps. So we can do it using a short CRS. CRS of size poly K, which is short. Doesn't depend on the entire computation. But of course the number of proofs is very big. So we kind of recurse. So then we take K proofs and we prove, and now we prove that actually you can go from C0 to CK squared, but the way we prove it is we say there exists proofs that kind of prove to you that you could go from C0 to CK squared. And we do it kind of inductively. So, but the only point I wanna emphasize is we need to prove that there exist proofs such that, this exist proofs is an, is an NP statement. And that's why we need this to, to um, allow for some non-determinism. So yeah, I'm not gonna say any more and also I'm running out of time. So let me just uh, summarize. So uh, <clears throat> our starting point was the BMW a heuristic, uh, which was privately verifiable. Uh, there's a, been a lot of work in the community trying to make this publicly verifiable. In particular, we talked about the two main paths that were taken to achieve this goal. Uh, one is to relax security, uh, to relax the semantic security. These works uh, <coughs> relied on knowledge assumption. Uh, the other was to not to relax semantic security, to keep semantic security, but uh, to require the encryption scheme to have a weak zero test. And this was previously required multilinear maps. And uh, what we show is we actually make part one, the path one and path two work 
uh, under a, um, assumptions on, on uh, uh, bilinear on groups with bilinear uh, maps, for which we do have instantiations. Uh, and uh, let me just end quickly. You know, since this is a crypto talk, and uh, uh, you can't do a crypto talk without mentioning the word obfuscation, I just want to mention that there's also delegation scheme from obfuscation. Okay, thank you. Fast enough during the talk, no pressure. <laughs>